Hi, it's Wednesday, January the 31st, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Luke's Gospel. And I apologize, due to technical problems, we are coming on very late today, so if you're used to watching these daily when they come out, um, I'm about five hours late. Shouldn't be a problem tomorrow, so I apologize for uh, the technical issue this time, but, uh, well, we'll go ahead and see what happens. Uh, anyway, today it's Luke 6, verses 6 to 11. Yesterday, the disciples broke Sabbath laws uh, by crushing grain with their hands and eating it. They were walking through a field, uh, and in their defense, Jesus referenced um, the eating and the sharing of the bread of presence. Uh, uh, David actually sharing the bread of presence with his hungry men, uh, which also was in violation of the rules. But uh, Jesus declared himself uh, Lord of the Sabbath, and I think implied that, like David, uh, he holds a special place. Um, or, as I wondered yesterday, that, in fact... Sabbath laws also depend on context and condition. There are things maybe more important. Um, anyway, let's go and see what happens now. So here it is, Luke 6, verses 6 to 11. On another Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught, and there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would cure on the Sabbath so they might find an accusation against him. Even though he knew what they were thinking, he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come stand here. He got up and stood there. And then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at all of them, he said to them, he said to him, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. So, here's another example of breaking the Sabbath law, except this time it's Jesus doing it, right? Before it was his disciples doing it. They were walking through the field, they're just grabbing the grain. Jesus defends them, but isn't really defending himself. Uh, and they heard it now, and, 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 and they heard his, his point, I assume. But now it seems they're watching for Jesus to do it, so they can make this a personal thing with Jesus. And, and let's be honest, they you know, our, our, the whole narrative we have is they're looking for a reason to to take Jesus out of play, to get him, uh, to arrest him. Uh, and I talked about it yesterday, but that's sort of the nefarious plot against Jesus. And, you know, the way the story goes, it's hard to deny that there's a nefarious plot against Jesus. And uh, from the Christian perspective, of course, there's a nefarious plot against Jesus. Anyone who isn't uh, on side with Jesus or doesn't get it or isn't trying to understand is on the wrong side from our perspective. But again, I remind you, the scribes, the Pharisees, it was their job to make sure that, that the people had resources for real faith, not fake faith. Part of their job was to point out the charlatans and the frauds and to say, no, what that man is saying is not right. That is not what the law of Moses says. And, and the people relied on the scribes and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were not bad guys. Not the first century Jews. Um, they were the good guys. They were the ones you counted on. right? They were, they, they were the, the teachers, the principal of the school, the crossing guard, the police officers. They were the people who, who made sure it was safe for you to live faithfully. And if something new came along, they were the ones who vetted it and said, don't listen to that. That's going to lead you astray, and here's why. Do listen to that. Yes, it's a new perspective, but it's in keeping. That was their job. So it would make sense that they're watching Jesus saying, okay, so he doesn't seem to have a problem with the Sabbath. And he's made an interesting argument thinking about David. That's true. Let's keep watching and see. Wait a minute. He's doing it again. He's doing it. And he's not even really thinking about it. It's, you know, I, I could argue as a Pharisee, you know, it's one thing to think about it and say, well, you know what? There are exceptions and there need to be exceptions. And hunger is, is, is perhaps a greater um, call than observing the Sabbath that I might uh, honor God. You might make that decision, you might not, but but you, you think about it. Um, but if you keep doing it, if you keep disregarding the rule, then it's clear that you don't believe in the rule at all. So it makes sense that they would keep watching, and then there they go, they see him do this. Um, and they're waiting to make that accusation, but Jesus knows that. And you know, the point that I get from, from Luke's gospel, Jesus knows that and he's not shying away from that. In fact, he's putting it back to them again as a question. 
I mean, before he, he talked about David getting the, taking the bread of presence and, and feeding it to, to his hungry troops, his hungry men. Uh, and here he's just saying, so is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? Like, are we supposed to be doing good in our relationship with God? Shouldn't that be a good thing? Is, is piety only about me or is it about the community? Is it about others? Can, can my relationship with God have a positive effect on others? And in fact, if I'm pursuing a, a, my relationship with God and in doing so, I'm having a negative effect on others, am I really, am I really doing justice? This, this is worth thinking about. And in this situation, so, so Jesus heals a man with a withered hand. And right up front, you go, well, yeah, good for you. Man had a withered hand. Um, nice. Good idea. Good idea to, to, to have helped him. That seems to make perfect sense. What's wrong with these people who are mad that he's doing it on the Sabbath? Come on, people, get over it. Um, absolutely. But I might reasonably ask Jesus, could you have waited to tomorrow? Could you have said to the man, this is the Sabbath, this is a time when we, we do our best as a community to honor God, and I want to help you. Do you think you could wait till tomorrow? Could you meet me here tomorrow morning first thing? Because if you do, I want to promise you, your hand will be restored. Could Jesus have done that? You say, well, yeah, but why should he wait? Well, because the Sabbath is important to the community. Is, is there not a way you could... Do that. I'm assuming this man's withered hand has been withered for more than an hour. If this man's been like his man's hand's been like this for 15 years, what is 12 more hours going to matter? But it allows us to to keep the Sabbath, to honor God. Maybe more to the point to honor our community who honor God in that way. Is there anything terribly wrong about that? And and, and I would love to have that discussion with Jesus. Uh, and indeed, I might come down and say, well, it's, no, I need to do this. I need to do this now. I need to do this now so that you can start talking about the Sabbath and what's important and what the priorities are and whether it's lawful to do good or to do harm. By the way, ignoring somebody, uh, ignoring somebody's um, uh, suffering, we'll say, uh, when you can do something about it, is that, is that a bad thing? Is it lawful to do good or to do harm is the question. Well, we'll assume that healing him is to do good. So not healing him, I assume, would be harm. I don't think Jesus was planning to hurt him further. <laughs> right? So, so Jesus is suggesting here perhaps that, but that not helping him is, is the same as doing harm. And it's not helping him when you have the power to help. That opens a fascinating question for me. I mean, the people around me. You know, the fella down the street who, who, who sleeps in the bushes and sometimes at the shelter and has his hand out for money. I could help him. I could give him money. I could go looking for him to give him money. I could, I could uh, bring him into my home. I could. But I don't. Am I doing him harm? I remember years ago, I had a really terrific um, theological discussion group. We met every two weeks. And, oh, the discussions were great. It, it was about 12 to 18 people in that group at a given time. We were together for, I don't know, five, six years. So it just, the level of discussion was fabulous. Better than anything I ever had in a seminary. Not knocking seminary. I loved seminary. And I've been part of some really good groups. So this was the best. And I won't go through why this group was great. Um, other than to say there was one person in particular, no longer with us, uh, a brilliant engineer. And um, he had an interesting definition of, of sin. Uh, so he would say that um, uh, suffering is not a sin if there's nothing that you can do about it. Um, but suffering is sinful when you can do something about it. So if there's suffering in the world that we could be answering, then there is sin in that because we are not answering that suffering. We are not doing something about it. Um, 
you know, if, if a tree falls and crushes somebody, that's not a sin. But if a rotted tree sits there and we just ignore it, say, whatever. Um, it says, you know, you know, Mike, you could cut that down and that would be a lot safer. And I go, yeah, I don't feel like it. Mike doesn't want to do it. And then the tree falls down and kills somebody. That was a sin because we could have fixed that. Uh, it, 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 the example that, 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 that my um, friend gave back then was uh, polio. He would say polio at one time was not a sin. Uh, that people had polio was not because we didn't, there's nothing we could do about it. He said, but today we can cure polio. And the fact that it exists at all in the world, uncontrolled, is a sin we should be doing. We should be taking care of that. We have the power, the ability, we have all the pieces we need to do it. We just don't do it. Therefore, our, um, uh, our prioritizing it the way we have or our disregard for it or indifference that's a sin that's what he would say um i kind of feel a hint of that here he's going to heal this man so i assume that's the good action but had he not healed the hand it sounds like that would be doing harm and jesus has the capacity the ability to heal so what a what a question that becomes what a wondering. To what extent is my responsibility to, to community, to, to, my, to my kindred, to my siblings around the world? What, what do, how I, where is my responsibility? Uh, where, where does it end? Where am I allowed to say, I can't, I, can't, I can't do that much? Am I allowed to keep a roof over my head um, while somebody else is homeless? Um, maybe I am. Am I allowed to have a spare bedroom while there's somebody on the street maybe who has nowhere to live? Could I have two spare bedrooms? Well, what if I have visitors? You know, I like to have a spare bedroom. Yeah, I know, but there are people who could use that. Am I, am I sinning by not putting people in those bedrooms all the time? I have money left over in my bank at the end of the month. I might put it away to save for my retirement or save for a, a college fund for my granddaughter or something like that. Um, but there's also somebody who could use that money right now and buy groceries. Am I doing harm? Am I sinning? Am I doing harm by not doing that? Jesus raises this question. I think it's a fantastic question. And it seems to be the way that Luke presents it. Jesus does this intentionally. He wants to make sure they're watching. And so he says, after looking around to everybody, stretch out your hand. And the man stretches out his hand and his hand is restored. Jesus does it absolutely publicly. And some would say, well, because what he's doing here is he's flaunting the authorities. Well, you know what? Sabbath law don't mean anything to me. I'm Lord of the Sabbath. Go ahead. Pick a fight with me. Come on. How do you like me now? Some say that. And I, I can't say that that's not an appropriate way to, to, um, to read this story. I, 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 perf I get it completely. But I'm fascinated by the question, is it lawful to do good or to do harm? And I think Jesus does this publicly, not so that he can thumb his nose uh, at those who are looking to catch him. Go ahead, catch me. Here I am. I don't think that's it. I think Jesus is inviting us to wonder about what are the limits of our Sabbath laws? When do we say enough with the Sabbath and now for life? I talked about that yesterday. You know, when do we say this is a good thing that we're doing? When do we say but inaction is now also sinful? It's also harm. If I don't espouse an opinion on what's happening in Gaza, if I don't pick a side between Israel and Hamas, Israel and Palestine, if I don't pick a side, am I, am I doing harm? Keeping my mouth shut when there's injustice, when there's suffering, am I doing harm? What if my acting act, my action could make a difference? They say, well, yeah, but I don't know for sure that it could. And I don't already know. Is it worth the risk? Jesus knows for sure that what he what he that he has the capacity to to heal this withered hand. He knows that he does. There's no question there. Maybe I could. Maybe I shouldn't. It's, I don't know. Jesus knows. But is our lack of certainty an excuse to just keep our hands in our pockets and do nothing? No, I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need to. I, I'm not certain that it'll make a difference. There are people in my life, uh, have been people in my life, 
where I knew they were hurting and I could say a kind word to them or I could say something to them that would, would make them feel better. And I've also thought, you know what? No, you made your bed, you lie in it. Have I done them harm? Because maybe I have. Because I could have done something that would have eased their pain somewhat. Maybe made them life better. Maybe let them on a, on a path that, that is better than the path that they were going to be on otherwise. It's a great question. And I think it's honestly a question that we, we can afford to ask ourselves all of the time. All the time. Am I doing too much? Am I doing enough? What does my indifference mean? When is my inaction the same as harm? People often say, you know, your silence is the same as assent. So if you witness, um, if you witness uh, racism, if you witness violence against the marginalized, if you witness oppression and say nothing, you are supporting the oppressor. And you're not supporting the victim. But if you speak up, now you're on the side of justice. To what extent? When do I get to say no? And I, I, I can't risk that. Ah, it's a great. It's a great question. And and I I will situationally and from time to time as well, just as a regular review, consider these kind of things and. Uh, and then go to bed and sleep at night because I have thought it through and say, yep, I am doing this much that I'm doing is in this moment enough. And then I'll think about it again next week. Um, or I may go to bed going like, you know what, I should be doing, I, I could be doing more. So tomorrow morning I'll get up and I'm going to do more. Here's what I'm going to do. Um, these things keep me active and, and, and for me, keep me growing in my faith and in my responsibility to my community, keep me growing in my understanding of who, who, who is my neighbor? Fabulous question from the Bible. Thank you very much. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus always answers that with a parable, right? Um, well, I mean, it's the introduction to the parable of the, good, of the Good Samaritan. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus gives them a parable, an invitation to wonder. Rather than being told, everybody with a vowel in their name is your neighbor. Rather than being told anything clever, witty, um, limiting, expanding, rather than that, Jesus tells them a parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Another reading, another time. But the point is, parables make us wonder for ourselves. And this does for me as well. And then the other thing that happens in the story, which I think is, is worthy of attention. Um, so he, he, he heals the man in view of the Pharisees, uh, who are good guys. Let's, again, I want to remind you, good guys. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. If they'd been filled with fury and discussed with, with one another what had happened, I'm good with that. I'd like it they didn't have to be filled with fury. If they were amazed and discussed with one another, that would be fine. But they're not discussing the event. They're not discussing the question of, who is my neighbor? How far do I extend myself? Is it, you know, is the Sabbath about doing good for the community or good for myself? Am I only meant to honor God or am I meant to honor God's creation? All those kind of questions that are worthy of our time and our wonder. No, they've skipped over that and focused on Jesus. And in doing that, they don't have to ask the question. They just got a problem with Jesus. So let's figure out what to do about Jesus. As if Jesus was out to cause their downfall. And that's not what Jesus is there to do at all. Jesus is inviting them to think, to reflect, to wonder, to, to shift their lives, to, to repent, in fact, to turn in some ways. Um, that's, that's what Jesus is there to do. And they avoid doing it by getting angry at him. Boy, oh boy, does that sound familiar. That sounds familiar as I look around the world. That sounds familiar as I look in the mirror. Rather than dealing with the issues presented, the, the, what, that's really important, I will focus on the one who has brought that issue to light. And I'll be angry at them. Because you know what? If they'd never brought that to light. It would have resolved itself. Or it wouldn't be real. 
There'd be no systemic racism if you hadn't pointed it out. Really? <laughs> but in, in, in getting angry at the person who did that, I don't have to talk about the issues. Being angry at all those woke people, I don't have to actually talk about some of the things that they have raised as concerns. I think it's a perfectly healthy and, 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 and wise to sit there and go, well, wait a minute. I think they've overstated this and some people have overstated that and I don't, their, their example doesn't work here, but it does work here. And you know what, if we looked at this carefully we, and then we learn, we don't have to agree with anybody whole, whole as bolus, whether we're talking about to the two, whether we're talking to the left or to the right, um, it doesn't matter. Rather than listening to anybody make a point, we go, well, that's them. And we just, we're furious about them. Republicans despise Democrats who despise Republicans. Liberals despise conservatives who despise liberals. The right hates the left. Nobody trusts anybody who doesn't fit into their group. And we put all of our effort and our energy into, into ad hominem attacks. We just, we just go after that person. Rather than talking about the questions that Jesus is answering, they are just going to focus now on Jesus. But if you look at how this progressed, they were initially amazed and they were engaged and now they've stopped. And that's important to me. That's informative to me because I can do the same thing. I can start by being amazed and engaged. And then there comes a point where you're like, I'm just done now. I'm done and I'm not listening anymore. Um, but this story reminds me that it is important to listen and that as soon as I've decided somebody is the problem, then there's a very good chance that I've lost track of what's at stake. I've lost track of the issues. I've just become tired of the engagement. And so I'm just going to put all my energy into vilifying the person who made me aware of a problem. Wow. Yeah. That's what the Pharisees have done and that's to me, how they stop being heroes and start to become nefarious plotters and schemers. Uh, they move from being positive influences in their community to becoming negative ones. Um, and it's a good story for me because I don't want to make that transition myself. I would rather be a positive influence in my community than a negative one. And sometimes it's hard to know. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there with you. Uh, it was a late start. At least I can do is, you know, finish before it gets dark. Uh, at least looking through my window. Anyway, so for now, let me offer a prayer. Loving God, thank you for the opportunity to wonder whenever it comes. First thing in the morning, middle of the afternoon, late night, before bed, sometimes even in sleep. God, thank you for the many ways that you engage us and invite us to, to wonder, to play, to speak, and to listen. God, we thank you that, that when we listen, we often hear your word. And as we've heard your word today, let us follow. Let us grow in faith. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's enough for me today, but I will see you tomorrow, which isn't really that far away. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, until I see you, God bless you. Please know that God sees you and knows you and loves you exactly as you are, exactly where you are. Please know that God's love not doesn't just surround you. It moves through you into the world. You help direct that love. You make a difference. That is the blessing. So God bless you. Thank you for being you. We'll see you tomorrow.